Welcome back, everyone. I imagine uh, if you were seeing that film for the first time, it was a really powerful experience, I hope. Um, I know for myself, I was seeing it probably the 10th time and still found that I got something out of it. So I'm really looking forward to bringing our conversation back together today. Um, we are, once again, a reminder that you can post your questions in the Q&A box and we'll um, send a few of them on to the moderator. We probably won't get to all of them, but we'll share all of them with our panelists and, and see if people want to engage with other answers on Twitter um, afterwards. Um, just a few starting announcements. Um, that we didn't say at the at the very start, uh, a thank you to our sponsors. Um, my name is Emily Badix. I'm the Associate Director at the Longmore Institute on Disability. And um, we were very pleased to uh, put on this organization, uh, this event today uh, as part of the Longmore Institute, but also Superfest Disability Film Festival, the longest running disability film festival in the world. Um, we were able to do this program thanks to our um, amazing supporters uh, and, and co-sponsors, which was San Francisco Senior and Disability Action, the hashtag No Body is Disposable Coalition, the California Care Rationing Coalition, Making Change Media, and Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund. Um, a thank you as well to the organizing team uh, that assembled the panelists that we're going to see today, um, Jessica Lehman, Don Haney, and our filmmaker, Regan Brashear. And a special thank you to Regan, um, who did an incredible thing by sharing this film with us today. Um, it's a risky thing to put your film online. She was willing to do it free of charge um, because of the importance of, of bridging it and using it to have these conversations. So thank you, Reagan. And also thank you to Fat Rose that was not on my list. Apologies, Fat Rose. Um, we're very grateful to have your sponsorship as well. Okay, so now if all the speakers can go ahead and join, add your video. And we're gonna give it just one minute as some folks are rejoining and we're getting all set up. Thanks again, everyone, for your patience with our timing. Okay. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, so I'll pass it to Nikki. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you, Emily. I'm so glad to be here this evening. Um, hi, I'm Nikki Brown Booker and I'm a mixed race woman with brown skin, short curly black hair with glasses um, and I'm wearing a black top. Um, and I am the program officer for the Disability Inclusion Fund at Borealis Philanthropy. And I'm really excited to be here this evening. Um, thank you for the film. It was really um, exciting and really fascinating. And I'm really excited uh, for the panel. So um, some things about the film, I was really struck by how we choose to spend money to fix things, um, fit it disabled people in wheelchairs with exoskeletons to experiment with walking, um, exoskeletons funded by the military for equipment. And I really think about the fact that today our country is spending money on sending rocket ships to space and funding cops to terrorize black and brown communities when we don't have enough money for PPE or hospital beds um, in the current um, pandemic uh, or for home and community programs that keep us out of institutions. 
in the disability community, we, we really have fought hard to redistribute funds where we need them so that we can live in the community rather than be institutionalized. So now we watch how institutionalization takes away people um, living during COVID-19. So what we're talking about tonight is how disposability or the myth of disposability shapes who is cared for and who is treated as expendable. We lift up the disability justice framework that nobody is disposable, a phrase originally coined by Patty Byrne of Sins Invalid, and we lift up campaigns to resist crisis care rationing and beyond. So I'm going to be moderating and alongside three panelists tonight, uh, Valerie Novak, Sylvia Yi, and Max Airborne. So our first panelist this evening is Valerie Novak. And um, Valerie will briefly tell you a little, um, please tell the audience a little bit about yourself and give an audio description of yourself when you answer the question. And the question I have for you is, um, we've been fighting for years now for Black Lives Matter. Um, something cracked open when we saw George Floyd brutally, brutally murdered by Minneapolis police with millions laid off of work or forced into essential worker roles without any protection from COVID. From your perspective, how do race, disability, and size play into who is perceived as expendable? And how are you seeing it being played out in real time through um, the COVID pandemic and police violence? Uh, yeah, thanks, Nikki. This is um, Valerie. I am an Afro-Latina uh, woman with um, short, curly, dark hair, and I'm sitting in front of a, a blue kind of abstract painting and a white wall. Um, I think there's a, a, a lot that we see, um, and even in, in this film that, that touches, um, that becomes really kind of evident, particularly what Patty Byrne talks about in the film um, that we're seeing kind of in real time the last several months, um, as far as these inequities that, that we experience, um, even before the, the recent um, George Floyd protests, we were seeing, you know, disproportionate effect on black, particularly black, but black and brown communities when it came to COVID. Um, and I think for what feels like at least the first time since I, I have been kind of a, in a more aware adult space, um, we were experiencing nationwide this event that made it um, a little harder to ignore the reality of the systemic in uh, inequality that has been built in. Um, but I think people also uh, were, had this, um, there's always somebody, right, that, that they have deemed as uh, sacrificable. Um, I remember one of the first things that, that I kept hearing all the time um, when we first started realizing that COVID was a serious issue uh, was kind of throwing out, well, you know, I don't need to worry. It really only affects old people and disabled people. Um, and then it seemed like, um, so that right there was kind of determining that, well, that, that group of people, I'm not part of those people. I'm not, um, and, and I don't need to worry because those are the only people getting, um, getting sick. And, and then we started seeing numbers. Um, I remember the first number I saw was that 70% of the people who had um, died in Chicago were black. And um, I remember seeing a headline that said, at one point, all of the people who had actually passed from COVID um, in St. Louis were black. And that was really scary to me because my parents are in St. Louis, right? And I, I remember calling my dad right away and being like, oh, you know, make sure you're washing your hands, make sure you're, um, and we know that these things are because of um, structural racism in our, in our systems. Um, the, the people who are disproportionately in are essential worker positions, the people who don't have access to healthcare, um, things like environmental racism that exacerbate things like um, asthma in the black community, for example. Um, 
but then, so, so I feel like we started from this place of already determining who we're willing to sacrifice, whether it's for the economy, whether it's for our comfort, for our ability to go get a haircut or go to the movies. Um, and then we're landed to where we are today, where, um, where we're a few weeks, three weeks or so outside of, of when protests started getting really heated um, regarding the, the death of, of people like George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Tony McDade and are seeing the same sort of um, disregard, right, for the people who are now putting themselves at risk in the middle of a global pandemic to fight for justice uh, and equality and, and still saying, um, kind of turning an eye to that and disregarding that those people are important. Um, despite the fact that at the very same time, we recognize that these are the people that keep our countries running, right? These are our essential workers. These are the people that, that we, we quite literally need um, to get food on our tables, to, to uh, build our homes and, and, and um, you know, clean our hospitals and take care of our loved ones. Um, and so I think that there's this, this uh, recognition, and I kind of want to take it back to the film, um, one of the people interviewed talks about how these technological advances we have largely come because of people who have disabilities. And I think it's really interesting that that's just another example of something that that people look at, you know, they look at a comic book or they look at a movie and they think, wow, that looks so cool. Or all the people that are interviewed about all the different, you know, things that they wish they had. Um, but then when we look at the actual people, uh, we see no value in them. And I think that we're in this kind of critical moment right now where a lot of these uh, identities that, that we have largely decided don't matter um, are kind of converging, whether that's uh, something like the, the rollbacks for healthcare for um, LGBT people, whether that's COVID and dismissing, you know, we, we know that over 50% of the people who have passed in the US from COVID are people in nursing homes, right? Um, or it's uh, the protests so that, you know, black people can, um, can exist without worried of being worried about getting shot by police. Um, we, we kind of push those things aside at the same time, fully depending on these exact groups to make sure that we can remain in comfort. Um, and so I, I, I think that there's a, a common thread um, through kind of all of these different groups um, in, in being both uh, essential to sort of the, the hierarchy that we have um, to keep things going while uh, being treated like they have uh, no value at all, regardless of what they're contributing to our society. Nikki, I think you're, yeah, there you go. There we go. Sorry. Thank you, Valerie. Um, so let's move on. That was, yeah, that was really great, really deep, actually. Um, so let's move on to Max. Um, Max, you were part of the team who said nobody is disposable as COVID hit and, fe and, and fears of care rationing emerged. Can you share more about how this campaign itself tied together intersectional politics, political interests across um, people of color, disabled and fat people, and older people? And how does the nobody is disposal hashtag draw together movements beyond, beyond care rationing as well? And please remember to introduce yourself and auto describe yourself. Thank you, Nikki. And thank you, Valerie, for your comments. Um, yeah, it's really great. Uh, so my name is Max Airborne and uh, the audio description of myself, I'm a fat, white, middle-aged, non-binary person with short brown hair. I'm wearing round, dark blue eyeglasses and a blue-green t-shirt. I don't, I'm not sure you can see it, but for, um, it, it's printed with a fat red fist and it says, Fatties Against Fascism. Um, so I've been an activist and organizer for most of my life, and a lot of it's been around liberation and racial justice. Um, been disabled for about 20 years, so like a little more than a third of my life. And when I found disability justice, 
um, which is a framework created very specifically by disabled and queer black people and people of color, it really became like a political and spiritual home for me. Uh, it felt like it brought together connections that I hadn't made yet for myself. And it, I feel like this is a really important thing to understand why no body is disposable makes sense because disability justice really effectively addresses the question of how do we fight for liberation um, without working to dismantle white supremacy, capitalism, and all the other systems of domination. It makes those connections. And so for anyone who hasn't yet seen it, please check out Sins Invalid's book. It's a disability justice primer. It's called Skin, Tooth, and Bone. And I think Dawn is going to tweet the link to that. Sure. So um, look for that. Uh, it's at Sin, Sins Invalid's website. Um, so yeah, so SINS really teaches about the concept of disposability, and I realize it's, it's disposability that is the thing that I've been fighting against in all the struggles that I've been involved in. And so a couple of years ago, my partner and I started working to organize with other fat people on the left, and we started this group called Fat Rose. And we were working last summer with Stacy Milburn. I'm just telling you the history of Nobody is Disposable as far as we've been using it. We were working with Stacy Milburn as she was founding the Disability Justice Culture Club. And um, there was a month of actions where different groups were hosting an action each day of the month of August last summer to um, close the concentration camps. Um, and we took a day uh, and decided to bring together fat and disabled communities um, as one group, which was new. You know, fat and disabled folks don't often join together. You know, there's a lot of stigma that keeps us apart, right? Fat people don't want to be disabled. Disabled people don't want to be fat. It's these oppressions and the language around them and our own internalization of them that keep us from being willing to connect and so we wanted to fight that um, that way that not only are we disposable, but we get separated. And so we came together to close the camps with a, um, a kind of sort of joining together in solidarity as fat and disabled people, some of whom are migrants, some of whom are not in support of migrants in general, some of whom are fat and some of whom are disabled. And we also knew that the camps were creating disabling conditions with their abuse. And so we chose nobody is disposable as a hashtag because we felt like we wanted people to get excited about this as a coalition. Um, um, Aurora Levens Morales, uh, there's a quote from her in the Sins book that I mentioned about how the body is the basis for a huge coalition. So when we look at all these oppressions across bodies, fat people, disabled people, black people, indigenous people, like all these ways that the body is um, seen as bad and oppressed. Um, what if we actually made connections between workers and other and people in camps? And you know, like what if we just made all those connections? So we were very excited to do that. And so um, we started a coalition around this hashtag last summer. And when COVID hit, um, and we learned that states were creating these triage guidelines for hospitals, saying who they believed hospitals should choose to deny care if care got rationed. And it was, uh, they named specifically fat people, disabled people, old people. Sometimes they used this language of comorbidities to kind of slightly disguise what they were saying. But um, all those groups were slated specifically as um, being the first to get refused care, right? So, um, the organization FLARE, it's Fat Legal Advocacy Research and Education, I think, um, approached us about doing work together against these triage guidelines and um, to support folks facing them. And so we did a few different things. Uh, one was we made some Know Your Rights guides um, that uh, also DREDF also worked on that and to help people basically fight for our lives if we had to face this discrimination. And as we started working together, we were really seeing in the press that they were saying that black communities were being hardest hit by COVID. The press really seized this idea that fat people are most likely to catch COVID. 
And it's really important to, in looking at that to understand that anti-fatness is often a smokescreen or a loophole for anti-black racism. And that's for a few reasons. And it's, you know, we don't often hear this stuff. We think of those as separate things, but they are very connected. So fat and disabled people both exist in higher ratios in black and indigenous communities. And through the work of black fat activists and the amazing research of a scholar named Sabrina Strings, um, I'm learning about how fat hatred actually emerged as a function of anti-blackness, very specifically. And also from Caleb Luna, who's a scholar at UC Berkeley, I recently learned that fat hatred was promoted during European colonization against indigenous folks. They didn't want the white folks, the European folks to develop indigenous bodies. And so it was about fat hatred, uh, which is essentially racism. <laughs> so in, you know, in today's society, we're still operating with this white supremacist ideal about what kind of body we're supposed to have. It's supposed to be thin and white and closest to whiteness as possible, able-bodied, young, healthy. And these things like discrimination and triage are basically using these frameworks to continue eugenics and genocide. So when you hear, you know, oh, fat people will lose them first, disabled people will lose them first, what's also being said and maybe isn't obvious is black people will let them die brown people will let them die, indigenous people will let them die. And so it's really important to make those connections. And so as we were seeing all these connections as things were emerging, um, it really felt like no bodies disposable was also a really great framing to, that made space for those intersections. And so we joined forces with Senior and Disability Action and DREDF and other disability and senior groups that I am sorry I did not make a list because I can't remember who all um, got involved initially. Mm -hmm. We wrote an open letter to medical providers seeing that they too were being considered disposable with not being given enough personal protective equipment, having to try to figure out their own, having to reuse a mask every day, right there, putting their lives at risk. And so meanwhile, we're spending money bombing other countries and there's billionaires, <laughs> you know? So talk about disposability, it's really, really, ugh. So um, there is a group called Justice in Aging and they, um, on seeing these guidelines, they wrote to the governor to, in California to protest the discrimination in these care guidelines. And then our coalition of nobody is disposable folks started working with them to get the guidelines revised. And in fact, the guidelines were revised and they were just published and folks worked really, really hard on it. And I know that the folks who worked on it are really proud of those guidelines and really want them to be um, accessible and um, looked to as a potential model that um, really reduces or eliminates um, loopholes for discrimination. Um, obviously, we can't actually control how discrimination happens, but it, it really, it, it's um, a little ray of sunshine. <laughs> in this whole kibosh. <laughs> so um, yeah, and I know that some of the attorneys who worked on that are also really wanting to support folks who wanna do that work in their own states with their own care guidelines. And so um, I can't access the chat, so I can't type any um, names in there for you, but we will try to send out some information about that after this call. Um, so I'm going to say check for now and uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, Max. So next we're going to hear from um, Sylvia. Um, Sylvia, I want to congratulate DREDF and the California Care Rationing Coalition for the recent California legal victory, um, pressuring the state to revise the original care rationing guidelines um, that Max was actually just speaking about to be less discriminatory against people of color, disabled and fat people and older people. This feels like a, an important win. And yet we also know that laws have limits and are only one part of social change. Can you talk with us more about what law can do and the limits of what law can't do? Uh, what is the interaction between law and social change? Hi, Nikki. Thank you for that nice and simple question. 
Um, I hope that everyone can hear me. My, um, I am a, a Chinese Canadian woman. I have tan skin and short black hair and glasses, and I'm wearing a blue shirt. Um, it was really wonderful to see it fixed again. I haven't seen it for a number of years, actually. Um, and it reminded me, watching it, of how law is not spoken of that much in the film, but I think underlies so much um, of what people are discussing. The, the film established, you know, fixed establishes areas where laws have been enacted in ways we recognize now is extremely harmful, such as the eugenics laws um, in various states. And also the law is, is not enacted in areas where we are reluctant to legislate, for example, in genetic testing. But where we choose to legislate or not also reflects our social values and whether we want to uphold a specific kind of status quo that provides for a certain type of resource distribution, um, one that values certain kinds of abilities and persons and groups above others, um, is something that we need to think a lot about. Um, it's certainly something we need to think about in, in a country where, the, and in a world where the gap between those who have and those who don't have is always widening. And where even when we recognize that that kind of a gap is not useful to the whole, we allow it to persist. So resources are never inherently and, un and automatically equal, and the law plays a role in how resources are distributed. Um, Max spoke a lot about you know, the medical rationing in California, and I, I think medical rationing in a COVID-19 surge situation where hospital ICUs and um, hospital equipment is, is, is limited is an extreme example of a common reality of unequal resource distribution. Um, it's just a very extreme example because of the, the pressure of life and death. We see and have seen the pressure to impose discriminatory decision-making that, with, with, that would withdraw treatment from people with disabilities simply because of the presence of, of what's considered a serious disability. Um, rationing in a lot of the states, the guidelines were very open, um, very open about how people with certain conditions, people with certain kinds of bodies, people with certain um, intellectual disabilities. So people who have different bodies and people who think differently or who considered not to think well, um, would, would simply be placed lower down the list or wouldn't be put on the list at all. That's, that's a very, very open kind of discrimination and we called it out as such. I think a lot of people in the country called it out as such. And so the law, federal disability rights laws, provided people with disabilities, um, fat people, um, our coalition, older people, provided us with the tools to bring administration, administrative complaints, challenging many of those state guidelines. That's something that happened across the country in a number of states. In California, we didn't have to file a complaint, but we were prepared to. So it, I think in that instance, the law is really important. Um, it helps to define recognized discrimination. It, it puts a name to it. And it puts the, the force of law behind our ideals of the kind of non-discriminatory society that we want. Um, I think law is also important because it buys time for our collective social values to catch up to and exceed what the law says. And I think there's been a very recent example of that in the LGBTQ ruling that came out of the Supreme Court this last Monday. In a lot of the analysis that I've seen, of that decision. Uh, newspapers and, and analysts have observed that I think it's 82% of the American public stands behind LGBTQ rights. And that's a big sea change in our social values and our social understanding of what is equal. 
the Supreme Court has justices on it. I mean, they haven't abruptly changed who they are or changed their approach to the law, but they still live in the world. They still live in society. And something like that, such a huge change is impossible to ignore or to say is irrelevant. So those are things I, I think are, you know, the law and social change interact in, in really profound ways. Um, and they can, they can inhibit one another and they can also, they can also bring to life certain ideals of the people who live in that society. Uh, uh, who want to, to have a different vision of the world, um, to see the world as a place that doesn't have to be ruled by inequality, by unequal resource distribution, um, and by our stereotypes about the worth of individuals, depending on what they look like, how they think, the color of their skin, their sexual orientation, or their sexual identity. Thanks, Sylvia. Um, so now we're gonna um, uh, we have some uh, gonna have some Q and A. Um, we have a couple of questions. Um, you know, feel free to uh, you know uh, put a question in the Q and A. Uh, we don't have a lot of time, but we'll try and see what we can get through. So um, one question is. Uh, for the panel. This film is really good for showing us some influential people with some really atrociously ableist ways of thinking. Um, so I want to ask the panelists, how do you respond to comments like this? Uh, what do you want to say back to some of the speakers? And anyone can answer that. Okay, um, I guess I can go. This is uh, Valerie again. Um, some of the, I, I originally saw this movie, uh, several years back and, um, I rewatched it again last night and then again today. And there were a few times where I was just completely, uh, jarred of certain things that I maybe on purpose removed from my memory. Um, there, there's one, uh, the, the MIT engineer who, uh, talks about, um, you know, completely eliminating disability uh, really kind of uh, shocks me because as somebody um, who has multiple disabilities, there are definitely things in my body that I think uh, sometimes I think if somebody showed up with a pill tomorrow that said, you know, we can make your pain go away, that would be really tempting to me. But there are also things, um, particularly, you know, mental disability that that is part of who I am and I like who I am. Um, I think that there is, there are parts to this film, particularly when, when they talk about choice, um, that I think is very valid because so many of us that are disabled um, really just want people to understand uh, that we like who we are um, and that we're happy with who we are and that uh, we're not necessarily um, looking to be different or looking to be healed um, in in the way that the world thinks that that we should be and so um, on one hand you know that kind of idea of everywhere you look people being different and accepted is really attractive where where I think um, people like that are missing kind of missing the the point is that we already exist in that world we just don't treat it that way um, we already exist in a world where everywhere we look, no body is exactly the same, no mind is exactly the same, but we don't honor that. Um, and I think that's why I feel such a kinship with, with so much of what uh, Patty Byrne says in, in this film, because um, many of the speakers do have this kind of idea that, um, or, or this vision of um, this kind of utopia, and, and that's a, a, a lovely idea, and I would kind of maybe love to live in that world as well, but also it really ignores that 
we kind of already live in that world and that's not how we treat people that are different, right? Um, even even the, the man who's, who's talking about wanting to give people that choice multiple times refers to himself and to, um, you know, not having um, his lower legs as, you know, being crippled and, and how he feels about when his bionic legs aren't on and things like that. Um, and so it seems like even maybe within himself, I don't want to speak for him, but maybe within himself, um, he hasn't quite embraced that vision that he seems to think could come from technology. And so um, I think I, I think my response to answer the question, I think my response would be that, that we could have that world now if we changed the way we felt about people and treated people and uh, viewed people who are different than us because we already live in a world of um, beautiful bio and uh, emotional, mental uh, diversity that we do not respect and that we do not cherish. Um, and so I, I'm, I, I'm not yet convinced um, that embracing something like transhumanism would suddenly change that. Um, I'm more of, of the mindset that it would really just exacerbate the inequalities that already exist, the stigmas that already exist, um, and, and eventually, you know, eliminate people like me that, um, you know, and, and people like uh, Max and maybe people like Sylvia that, um, and, and you all that are watching that I think we all inherently have something uh, really wonderful to offer just by, by virtue of being human and being alive and, and um, that natural diversity um, to humanity. Thank you, Valerie. Um, I also, one thing I was also really struck by was the fact like, so who chooses who, uh, who you know, gets the, the bionic arm or who, you know, who, if you can't afford that, then, and your insurance isn't going to pay for it, then who, who actually makes that choice? That's, that's also like really struck me that, you know, we're living in a world where we can barely, people can barely afford food on their table or to go to the doctor when they're sick. And, um, and that our government system really um, puts us in a place where we don't get to make those a, a lot of choices about how, uh, about our healthcare system. So that was something that I was really struck also. Um, in the film. So, okay, we have, so we have another question. Um, how can people with disabilities be, in, put a, be really be put in charge of kind of designing um, their own, I guess, their own extensions of their, of their, uh, of their body and, or what, what really, uh, how, basically, how can people really, you know, have to have chart take a have control over over their bodies. Would any of our panelists like to take a stab at that? Oh, you're on mute, Sylvia. Just okay. just feeling with that right now. <laughs> Um, I, I, and I, I don't mean to be avoiding the question or not wanting to address it. It's actually led me to thinking about how, I, I don't know that it's possible to, for any of us to control our bodies, even those who don't have disabilities, we age <laughs> and our bodies change. Um, and we live in a society where when we're interacting with others, we're interacting with buildings and environments that we don't control. Um, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm, what the question made me think about is, of course, what Valerie was just speaking about, the, the, the whole economic reality of that we don't, we don't fully control our, our, our resources. In fact, we barely control our, our resources. Um, and in the healthcare field, greater awareness of the social determinants of health helps us to understand as, as well how the life we live in the environment we live in determines so much of our health or our lack of health, um, completely irrespective of having a disability or not having a disability. Um, I, I, what really, the other thing it made me really think about is how, how 
all, so many of the speakers in fixed were, th were thinking of human, but they were thinking of it in very individual terms instead of in community terms. And I, 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 it just has made me think about how what we think of as human or not human, whether it's our body or how we think or how we do things, is key to community, is, is key to our interrelationship with one another, whether we're kind to one another or not, whether we accept one another or not, whether we value one another or not. Um, and I, I just think that's a really important thing that's lost a lot of the time in our, in our conversations. Um, Thanks, Sylvia. Um, so I think we might have time for one more question. Um, so would anyone care to speculate on what you think would happen if these technologies were employed by the far, far right? Um, that possibly seemed remote when the film was made, but now it feels a lot more real. Um, this is Valerie, I guess, if no one else wants to attempt that. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know, uh, you know, I think ableism and white supremacy, I think um, the way that we treat bodies that are different is doesn't fall on party lines. I think maybe we'd like to believe it does. Um, but I, I don't know that it does. And I think uh, the current, what we experience with COVID, what we're seeing with, uh, you know, the, the care rationing that uh, nobody is disposable has been working around um, that uh, Sylvia and, and their team worked on as far as um, the civil rights complaints. That is, that is happening now. That is not uh, theoretical. It's not something, um, that we're worried might happen. Um, you know, I know people who, who uh, I, I realized I didn't really introduce myself, but in the policy work that I do, uh, who reached out and said, you know, am I gonna need to be worried about somebody coming into my house and taking my ventilator because a doctor has deemed that somebody else is better off using it? Um, so I, I, I think that, um, that for something like ableism, the, the ableism is so entrenched in the way that we work. I think breaking it along along um, political lines is is kind of a way to separate some of us from our responsibility to call, both call that out and our personal responsibility to acknowledge where we're where we are um, continuing to uphold and uplift. Um, the way that that ableism is is systemic, um, but I, I I think that that we are kind of seeing um, policies. You know, I mentioned before. I think just because it 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 resonated so so much, um, the the healthcare rollbacks uh, and protections for for particularly trans but LGBTQ um, plus individuals that just happened. I think that's another perfect example um, of of slowly. Uh, or sometimes quickly just chipping away at any progress that has been made um, in providing uh, rights and protections uh, for for the other, I guess you can say. Um, but I, I do think that largely that that goes far beyond um, just just you know far right or far left or, or center. Um, it, it, it goes all across the same way that as much as we may not like to talk about it, things like white supremacy are very much prevalent on, you know, the, the left side as they are on the right side. Um, it just shows up a little bit different a lot of times. Thank you, Valerie. So we're almost uh, out of time. Um, and, you know, uh, it was just really, really some excellent um, answers that you all gave. Um, 
let's maybe just do a one word. Uh, what it, what what is the opposite of disposability? Can you just each give like one word or what you think that what is the opposite of disposability? And let's go to Max first. I would say sacredness. Uh, Sylvia? <laughs> You're on mute. Okay, sorry. Very slow at clicking the buttons. <laughs> um, Oh, I, I first thought of irreplaceable, but I, thinking of what we do to the planet and to extinct species, I, 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 I think we dispose of irreplaceable things. Um, so I don't know if that's the opposite. You know, I, I think I'm going to, to, to sort of stick with community as a kind of, a kind of way to avoid disposability because when we think one is disposable, it's going to come back on us all. Thanks. Valerie? Oh, those are both very good answers. Um, I think I'm going to go with uh, invaluable. Um, I think particularly in our very, very, our, our culture is very, very obsessed with wage labor and with value and worth as attached to our dollar. And so I think I kind of want to turn that on, on its head and say, um, it, it, we are invaluable uh, for existing. Um, and, and, and to me that that means none of us are disposable. So I think I'm going to go, I'm going to go with that. Thank you. So thank you all for, um, you know, giving us those really beautiful wise words. Um, I just want our audience to know that this event is free, but we are encouraging participants to make a donation to one or all of these black centered, uh, black led centered projects. Um, uh, Sins Invalid, uh, the color of change crip camp relief fund um oh and uh heard helping educate to advance the rights of deaf communities um i believe that we will send those out to you uh, uh or actually they're in the chat so you can um there are links to the chat um sent and valid is a disability justice-based performance project and movement building organization that centers disabled people of color, queer, trans, and non-binary people with disabilities. And you can get their disability justice primer uh, titled Skin, Tooth, and Bone. The basis of movement is our people um, at the tiny URL at slash sin shopping. Um, I'm going to running out of time, so I'm going to skip down. And uh, the Color of Change Crip Camp Relief Fund, uh, the Crip Camp Impact Campaign in partnership with Color of Change, has established an emergency relief fund for disabled creatives and activists. Many have lost all or most of their income and are freelancers or independent contractors that don't qualify for unemployment benefits. And this fund will ensure that activists, storytellers, and cultural influencers of the future can continue the vital work that Crip Camp champions. And then um, HERD is a voluntary dependent organization that works to correct and prevent wrongful convictions of deaf disabled people and end all forms of abuse and incarceration of people with disabilities. And um, they uh, heard is refining its mission, vision, values to reflect that HERD is, is a police and prison abolition organization. 
Um, so feel, please um, donate to uh, any of those organizations. Um, and I believe uh, I just want to thank everyone for really um, showing up and participating and supporting the film. And thank again all of our uh, sponsors and our wonderful panelists. Have a good night. Good night.